different treatments we'll talk about are very helpful to facilitate tissue healing, to reduce pain, reduce inflammation, um, or natural methods of uh, healing of various musculoskeletal or orthopedic conditions. Um, but we are very cautious in uh, using terms that are poorly validated. Um, these are some of the disclosures that I commonly will put out there when I do lectures across the country. I have a couple of textbooks I've been involved with. I'm on uh, a few advisory boards. Um, I am the past president of a very uh, interesting organization called the Interventional Now called Orthobiologics Foundation, which is dedicated to the um, education standards and guidelines in this area of um, orthobiologics or using your own body substances to help in healing. And I'm a proud graduate of Villanova University. So just a little overview of the impact and all of you that are um, here tonight and listening in, um, obviously have some uh, personal relationship to having an orthopedic condition or musculoskeletal condition, but you are not alone. This uh, affects one in two adults, uh, large amounts of cost in terms of not only treatment, but in lost wages. Uh, it represents the number two reason why patients see uh, physicians um, only behind upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, many million visits for low back pain, bone and joint pain, and there's a rising problem with uh, childhood orthopedic injuries, which later go on to have other problems like, um, like arthritis. Um, this continues to increase, 131% increase in 2011 over 2000, and now we're in 2020, um, and that number has not decreased, it only increases. This is a nice uh, infographic that's available to the general public. If you Google it, you'll see lots of nice information regarding the scope of the problem. And I found it very interesting, but there were some uh, quotes within that that were stunning to me that included this quote, that if we continue on this current trajectory, we're choosing to accept more prevalence and incidence of these with spiraling costs and less success in alleviating pain and, su and suffering. So it basically was saying that the country was not on the right path in the treatment of these ever escalating uh, problems. And in 2011, when this first uh, pro, uh, journal came out, it said that time to act uh, to come up with evidence-based evidence interventions and effective treatment is now. Well, we're now another 10 years down the road, and I'm, unfortunately, I don't think anything has gotten a whole lot better. Some of it has to do with the classic and still every day and maybe getting worse every day uh, treatment of orthopedic conditions, whether that's in an internal medicine, primary care office, orthopedic office, even physical medicine rehabilitation offices, where the office visits are very brief. Uh, patients often don't get to even tell their full history or story. Uh, there's often very little physical examination. There's a lot of x-rays and MRIs with the knowledge that those uh, findings on x-rays and MRI often don't correlate with what people complain about. There's a lot of use of medications, including NSAIDs, non anti-inflammatory drugs which are associated with multiple um, medical side effects, ranging from gastrointestinal to hypertension, cardiovascular, uh, stroke, and even deaths. Um, in fact, the, the uh, FDA has put a black box warning on every non anti-inflammatory. That includes the things that you buy over the counter. Uh, people often get to refer to physical therapy. Those physical therapy visits are often not very robust, and the word physical therapy is pretty generic. So many people get hot packs, they get ultrasound, they get electrical stimulation. Most of those treatments are not with really good evidence, and at the end of the day, end up being a big waste of time. Uh, when you go back to your physician, it doesn't get better. People get shots of cortisone, often many times with the knowledge now that we know that cortisone inhibits tissue healing, has toxic effects on uh, cartilage, has toxic effects on tendons. And then when all that doesn't work, then surgery is offered. And most patients who have failed everything else uh, and feel like there is no other option, then will opt for surgery. Um, in the United States, we do more surgery than any other industrial country in the world. And um, the outcomes for many of those surgeries are not the best. Um, and you know, people often will criticize this area of orthobiologics or regenerative medicine treatments as not being scientifically validated or not having enough literature. But in fact, if you look at the current treatments that are offered, 
by orthopedic and sports medicine specialists, only 20% are felt to be supported by at least one low risk biased randomized control study. So 80% of what is done is really not really well validated. And that's published in the British Medical Journal, which is um, you know, a, a very reputable journal. There are common sports injuries as well as injuries in everyday uh, living. Uh, those include meniscal tears, injuries to cartilage or chondral lesions, and rotator cuff tears. And when we look at the literature to support these, in particular for partial meniscectomy or the uh, shaving of cartilage, which is the most common surgery in America, about 700,000 surgeries per year, the recent literature of the last five years has really shown that that surgery is not the best surgery. In fact, in a study that was done in Finland showed that it was no better than a sham or fake surgery where patients were actually taken to the operating room. They were in the operating room for the same amount of time. They even had the same nicks done on the skin as if you would have an arthroscopy. And so again, massive orthopedic reviews showing that uh, uh, arthroscopic surgery for degenerative meniscal tears are not really beneficial and often associated with some negative effects, in particular the acceleration of underlying arthritis. Um, and this came out of a clinical journal, Sports Medicine, an orthopedic journal that talked about that really uh, physicians should discontinue this type of surgery uh, with a pressing need to really figure out whether there's any benefit from performing that surgery. Um, and so we're left with uh, patients who have exhausted the normal things, right? So you've tried some diet, you tried some exercise, you tried some medications, you tried some glucosamine, chondroitin, you tried the injections, cortisone, you tried the lubricating injections. And so you fall in what's referred to as the osteoarthritis treatment gap. And, you know, it's estimated that any, anywhere from three to 10 million Americans will sit in this gap and they can sit in this gap anywhere from 10 to 20 years. Uh, so there's a pressing need then to kind of figure out what else could be done. One method is uh, what is referred to as stem cell therapies, and there are a variety of areas where we can find stem cells. We are also very cautious with the terminology stem cells because people misuse that and will offer people quote unquote stem cells with amniotic fluid or umbilical cord cells which when you look at them, really have hardly any, if any at all, stem cells. So that brings us to why you're here tonight and why we're putting on this um, webinar. Uh, you know, New Jersey Regenerative Institute, why us um, compared to all the other places you could go? And I'm gonna list a few of the things that I think are really important and things that myself, my partners, and the rest of our staff are really proud of. So it's the training of the physicians and the staff. It's the dedication to this non-surgical treatment of orthopedic conditions. So we're not surgeons who are doing this as a side thing. Um, our, our experience in this area, the data that we've collected for over 10 years, and the research that we've done, and the ongoing research things that I'll talk about at the end. So in terms of training of physicians and staff, all physicians are we're board certified, uh, we're uh, medical doctors. Actually, Dr. Bowen is an osteopathic doctor, so I wanna uh, make sure that that's correct. We're all board certified in physical medicine, rehabilitation, and sports medicine. Myself and Dr. Uh, Bowen are also board certified in pain medicine, so he and I are board certified in three specialties. We all have experience in guided injections, either using fluoroscopic or x-ray guided guidance or ultrasound guided procedures. Uh, so the procedures are done precisely. I, I added it up. We have about 70 years of non-operative experience with, uh, you know, multiple quote unquote best doctor awards ranging from, you know, uh, New Jersey Monthly Best Doctor to Castle Conley, New Jersey uh, Best Doctors to a variety of different best doctor awards. We were the earliest group in the East Coast to perform these various regenerative procedures such as platelet-rich plasma, bone marrow procedures, and adipose procedures. We've uh, lectured and we've educated many different doctors, residents, fellows on these procedures for over a decade. We have multiple publications, book chapters, and textbooks, probably, I would say, more than anyone in the Northeastern United States in this particular area. The next area is data. So, you know, uh, the Jerry Maguire movie, uh, you know, there's the agent and the player, and the player says, show me the money. 
what I would say in medicine, in terms of somebody telling you, oh, this is a procedure and this procedure works, I would say, show me the data. So we've been collecting data at our own expense and our own energy uh, since 2012. We initiated a patient registry where we have patients fill out forms in 2016. We then started an app-based national registry uh, in 2018 called Data Biologics, and that's our little logo up top. We now have uh, between 40 and 50 clinics and physicians who are uh, adding data and uh, over 1,500 patients now in just under, or just over a year, are included in that database. So when you ask me, does it work? I, our response, or my partners, our response is not based off of something off the top of my head or what I think is the answer. It's based on the current medical literature and our knowledge of that literature, as well as the collection of our own data. So if you come to me and you're a woman and you're in your 50s and you have arthritis and it's moderate arthritis, and you ask me, what does XYZ do and how well does it work? I can tell you that based on the medical literature, this is what the information is, and I can base, based on our collection of data, this is how well you might do. In terms of research, we've published more articles and book chapters in this area of regenerative treatments than any other group in the, in the Northeast. We currently have uh, five to six ongoing research projects, and many of our research are in, co in collaboration with the Kessler Foundation through a grant by a benefactor uh, called the Durfner Fund. Uh, and that fund now has helped us with research in uh, spinal cord patients that have rotator cuff pathology um, and a few other studies that we have ongoing. We have over $2 million right now in funding and we're probably gonna be pursuing another one to two million. We are also a study site for four national studies that we'll talk about at the very end. Um, some of our prior research includes research on uh, shoulder pain with arthritis and rotator cuff using microfragmented adipose tissue, a, a specific device called lipogens. Um, a study where we treated uh, patients who are wheelchair dependent, spinal cord injured, who have rotator cuff pathology. So all of us who use our shoulders, you know, it can be pretty painful, but if you are paraplegic or quadriplegic, you rely on your arms to move you around. So your arms become weight-bearing things. And to have any type of surgery would mean that you wouldn't even be able, someone would have to move you in and out of bed, in and out of chairs, or wheel you down hallways. So we finished now a 10 subject uh, study in this population with really dramatic results. This was some of the information regarding uh, the background of the folks. They, were, they had spinal cord injury for over 20 years in their late 50s. Some patients had pain on both sides. Um, more men than women, and you know their improvement in terms of their pain, the NR uh, numeric uh, pain scale, and these other pain scales was dramatic. It wasn't 10%, it wasn't 20%, it was 82%, 86%, 88%. And now we finished 10 subjects, and now we have a grant to study this even further. Um, brief pain inventory, which is a validated, just generalized pain, uh, you know, a decrease of 88%. Now that is really meaningful data in terms of uh, outcomes in my mind and I think in most patients' mind. We uh, did a case report on the very first uh, patient in this study. He was a former firefighter who had a beam land on his middle of his back and had a spinal cord injury and was paralyzed. He was a really avid exerciser, uh, had a climbing rope in his backyard even after his injury would take quote unquote walks with his wife for five miles, uh, had actually um, surgery on his opposite side and came to us. And uh, he, these are his outcomes on the bottom left. So dramatic improvements in all those different scales. That's his pre and post MRI, which I will tell you shows improvement of the tendon. And that's him sort of showing off at a, a Kessler event, uh, showing how much he can do. So very gratifying and very good for him. Uh, there is some debate in the literature and things that you may have seen on the internet and, and, and different advertising that bone marrow is better than adipose or adipose is better than bone marrow. Uh, we were part of a point counterpoint debating this for knee arthritis. And at the end of the day, 
it looks like for certain patient population, adipose is better, and then maybe in a certain subtype, bone marrow might be better. We also reviewed the literature on this specific method of doing it called microfragmented adipose tissue and showed that this is an FDA uh, compliant method that is safe and, and potentially effective. I talked about our database. This database is IRB approved, um, and we have looked at a variety of different areas, the knee, the hip, the shoulder, and so these are some of the initial data uh, of patients that were treated with that lipogen procedure over time. Obviously, some things do better than others, um, and, and these were data that now we were replacing with ongoing data that's more robust than this data. In terms of just looking at things in general, we first look to see if there are any complications. So one of the first premises of medicine is first do no harm. Uh, and so we're looking for any complications. Some people got some bruising, some people got a little a hematoma. There was one case of a local skin infection uh, that was treated with an antibiotic, somebody who had had recurrent skin infections. There were no major complications. That's at where we harvest the adipose. In terms of where we inject it, other than some local pain and inflammation lasting a few days, there were no infections and there were no major complications from it. So based on that data, we know it's safe. We know that at least through three months, but now we have data all the way to two years, that it's effective, that some areas like the hip joint and the patella tendon really were a challenging for us. Uh, we have completed a, another study, a degenerative um, meniscal tear study. This was a poster on the first patient that we treated a 55-year-old competitive triathlete who had knee pain, was told she had a meniscal tear and some arthritis, and, and APM, which stands for arthroscopic partial meniscectomy, was recommended after she failed to improve. These are some of her MRI imaging show, showing the tear. I don't know if that shows up with my marker, but there's a tear on the uh, posterior horn of the medial meniscus with um, on the bottom picture some uh, white areas in the back of her kneecap, her cartilage. So three months later, we followed her in terms of a COOS, which is a functional knee scale, and she was 95% better. Six months later, she was 97% better. She started with a merit pain of five to six. It went down to one and then to zero. She returned to triathlete racing and won her age group in the world championship with, with a team. Um, and placed fifth in her age group in the U.S. National Championship. Again, really gratifying. So this study was continued to include 20 patients. Again, a variety of scales that we looked at and then things followed over time. VAS stands for Visual Analog Scale. COOS is the, is the broad functional scale and has subscales that include symptoms, pain, function, sports, the p-value, any p-value that's better than 0 0.01 is quite good. You can see there's a lot of other zeros, so that makes it really highly significant um, outcomes. And this is what it looks like in terms of a graphic improvement over time. This was uh, compared to what you would normally see with the meniscal uh, resection, and these uh, supersede that. Much faster recovery than surgery, much less potential for morbidity, morbidity as, over time. We also studied with an orthopedic surgeon um, in Chicago. He took very severe patients who were fairly old, 72 year old with grade three to four arthritis. So grade four arthritis is bone on bone. Uh, most mild arthritis is grade one, moderate grade two. Once you get to three to four, that's pretty severe arthritis. These patients were treated with adipose tissue and at least through 12 months, did pretty well. Um, I would say that many people that have grade four arthritis and a, an alignment problem, um, we often would say, if it's biomechanical, then surgery is your best option. So we, we don't offer this to, any, to everyone, only if it's gonna make a difference. And these are the scales where you can see improvements over time through six months and 12 months, uh, where you have significant improvements, again, with high p-values. Uh, greater than 0 0.002 at, the, at six months, and then it declines at 12 months. Current studies, uh, we now have a grant to do what's called a randomized control study for spinal cord patients injected with that microfragmented adipose tissue to further validate that treatment. 
Uh, we are involved in a multi-center study uh, looking at chronic partial rotator cuff tears. And we also have a military study for meniscal tears uh, in the 20 to 40 age, uh, age group. Um, we are doing several studies, again, with the Kessler Foundation. Trevor Dyson Hudson is the head of their spinal cord injury research. And uh, last year, we were awarded a grant of uh, 549000 by the New Jersey Commission to further study this using that randomized control study. This is what we call the Ingeneron study. Ingeneron is the company sponsoring the study, looking at the safety and effectiveness of patients that have partial rotator cuff tears that have not improved. This is also a double-blinded randomized control study. So this is the highest level where no one really knows what you have except for discrete people in the study. Um, there's gonna be 246 people total in this study. And we are, we are one of, uh, I think, 20 study sites uh, that are recruiting for this study. Um, this is the uh, military study for the tissue. It's registered now in clinicaltrials.gov. So if you ever wanna see who's got an active study and who's registering. Uh, so we're, we are now recruiting we did our first uh, patient last week. We are doing this in our center as well as two other military site centers. You don't have to be in the military to be in the study, but you do have to be in a military age of between 20 and 40. The newest study that we are now in, uh, actively uh, ramping up to be involved with is another super fascinating study. It's a new method of taking adipose tissue and processing it in a method that is being done with FDA approval. So this is an FDA approved trial looking at knee osteoarthritis with prior uh, uh, results um, in a smaller study and non-randomized showing dramatic improvements in patients. That study will include 124 subjects. Um, most of them would get be active, but one third get a placebo, uh, which is just sterile water. Um, and they'll be followed all, all the way through 12 months. Um, and, you know, they'll have, uh, if you're part of the study, you're, you're there for your initial visit, day two, three months, six months, and 12 months, and we'll be part one of 12 centers across the country on this really exciting study. Uh, the other study we're part of is a disc herniation study. It's not exactly regenerative treatment, but it is a method of, of trying to avoid surgery. This is a disc herniation at L4-5 or L5-S1. Has to have nerve root impingement on your MRI. You have to have what's called radiculopathy or pain that radiates down into a leg. And you have to have tried conservative treatment for at least six weeks. Um, so that's a fast overview. I apologize for sometimes a lot of words on the slide, but I uh, just wanted to get through because question and answer are, are really what we're gonna try to uh, help you through these. And I think everyone's questions and when they hear the answer uh, can be helpful. So we know that orthopedic and musculoskeletal conditions are a large burden on our healthcare system and affects many people, including many people like yourself and actually even myself. Um, we know that currently we are using uh, treatments that are really outdated and of questionable benefit and some of which are actually harmful to patients. Um, now, unfortunately, those treatments are covered by insurance. Um, these treatments that we offer are not. Um, that's another probably two-hour debate session if we're talk, going to talk about why does insurance cover these things. Um, there is increasing evidence, uh, and this evidence is out of basic science, animal model, and clinically, uh, clinical case series of platelet-rich plasma, um, of stem cell therapies um, for a variety of orthopedic conditions. Um, New Jersey Regenerative Institute, I think, has the best trained staff. We use the best equipment and products. We collect data, and therefore, we have our own data to share with patients. Um, we make no promises on what's going to happen. Uh, I think a lot of patients uh, go to places where they promise 100%, 90% improvement. They promise you you'll be able to do all sorts of different things. Here are our promises. We're gonna exhaust all other non-surgical options, and there's a host of them that don't necessarily even include some of the treatments we've talked about. The treatments we're gonna recommend, we're gonna recommend based on evidence in medical literature, 
uh, that shows that that treatment has a chance of working, not only um, scientific literature that's out there, but our own. We're gonna use the best products. We're not gonna only use a single thing because that's what, quote unquote, we do. We're not gonna only offer bone marrow, only offer adipose, only offer PRP, only offer amniotic. We're gonna make sure that the product is tailored to the needs of the patient. We're gonna use the best techniques, meaning that after we do a careful history and examination, and we get to the point of getting to a procedure, we're gonna guide the procedure, we're gonna use the best ways of obtaining bone marrow and adipose. Um, so ultimately, summing that up, we're gonna give our best effort, uh, and we'll do it with uh, a nice environment and a really caring staff. Uh, we get so many compliments on our staff, ranging from our front desk uh, greeter, Shannon, to our great medical assistants, uh, such as Rachel. And so that all uh, is very important for uh, making your experience and the outcomes the best they can be. So when I lecture across the country, you know, I urge my um, colleagues to stop using things that don't work and are not validated and maybe think about things that are innovative and have uh, evidence. Um, this is an article that was in USA Today, talked about two brothers in a small town in Virginia that started using adipose stem cells in the 1960s. So as far as I can calculate, that was 60 years ago. So we think we are like, wow, futuristic, but we're using things that two brothers in Virginia who were thoughtful were considering in the 1960s. So these are the things we're recruiting for. Uh, maybe you fit into one of these. Meniscal tear study, ages 20 to 40, partial rotator cuff tear, uh, refractory other uh, treatments, disc herniation with a pinched nerve or radiculopathy, and the knee osteoarthritis studied by the GID group. That's it. Okay, great. All right, so we're just gonna go over some of the uh, questions that came through during the webinar, and uh, I will be directing those towards Dr. Malanga. If anybody else has questions while we're going through this session, feel free again to type them in the Q&A section down below of the Zoom window here. Okay, so the first question we have is, why do some people with herniated discs have no symptoms and others have a lot of pain? Do herniated discs ever heal? Really great question. Um, sort of up there with one of the mysteries of life, quite frankly. So we know if we get MRIs of people who have no symptoms that in certain age groups, they can have findings of disc herniation in up to 30, 40%. Um, and these are patients that have, that do everything and have no symptoms. And there are other people who have really severe back pain um, and even irritation of nerves that if you get their MRI, it really doesn't show a whole lot. So the reason why one person has pain and another one doesn't is really not clear. We, there is a rising uh, evidence for a variety of medical conditions that underlying inflammation in your body is a source um, and a driver of a variety of disease states. That ranges from heart disease, um, different gastrointestinal problems, um, migraines. Um, and so this systemic inflammation um, has become more recognized as being a source of pain in patients that have a variety of musculoskeletal orthopedic condition, ranging from knee arthritis to rotator cuff tears. And when patients come to me and have you know, a specific problem, but then they also tell me that their back hurts and then they have heel pain and then their elbow hurts, then I start to think about, and I always think about, what are some of the underlying drivers of systemic inflammation? One of the big drivers is our diet, uh, one of the big methods of helping with that is um, protecting our gut. Um, gut health is really, really important. So while I don't have the full expertise of that, I truly recognize and we try to address those things. We uh, are very uh, fortunate to have partners in other areas, including a natural path. Um, and then if those areas you know, are persistent, a, pers a persistent disc problem, then we try to be as natural as we can to induce your own body to heal that tissue, whether it's a herniated disc or any other structure. Okay, great. The next question here is, I had an ACL reconstructive surgery 20 years ago and I'm having the pain again. Will the procedures that we offer 
help with that ligament and fix the pain? So a really good question and points out some of the misconceptions about surgery like ACL reconstruction. So ACL reconstruction surgery is really helpful if you have a knee that really is unstable and moves around too much. And every time you go to pivot, every time you go to jump and land, your knee feels like it goes out of place. But unfortunately, it does not address any underlying cartilage thing that uh, process that may um, cause pain. So your ACL tear uh, after the acute episode is really not painful. It's just unstable. That pain occurs because of the cartilage damage that often occurs. And in fact, there are research that shows whether you have your ACL reconstructed or not, even in very young age groups, in 10 years, you'll have findings of arthritis of that knee. So there's an area of drivers of inflammatory mediators that are called cytokines. Um, and it's those cytokines that are felt to be important in uh, progressive of arthritis and other cytokines that can be helpful and protective. And simple things like platelet-rich plasma are felt to be um, uh, a way of modulating those cytokines so that you can upregulate those that are healthy for the joint and downregulate those that cause ongoing pain, inflammation, and breakdown of the joint. Okay, the next question we have here is what ages are, what ages can participate in the knee osteoarthritis study? Uh, so that's a really nice study because it's very uh, inclusive of broad age groups. Um, I think it goes from 30 to 80. Uh, it covers all levels of arthritis. And some of the studies will only allow you in a study if you only have arthritis on one knee and not the other. We, were part, we are part of another study where it's really difficult because if you have moderate arthritis in the opposite knee, you can't get the treatment. So um, pretty wide age group. We are now in the process of becoming fully enrolled in that study. So I would say by the end of August, we would uh, be able to start enrolling folks. If you wanted to put your name on a list, we could start getting on that list. Okay, the next question is, what will, what is the latest treatment options for patients with disc herniation with persistent back pain, but no radiculopathy? Mm, that is a really, um, that is the holy grail of spine surgery and pain management of patients that so that's called discogenic low back pain. So the picture on the right with that disc that has those fissures, you know, that disc isn't herniated, but that disc can become painful. Uh, and so um, when you have that, the current treatments are pretty meager and include having a fusion of that spine. Spinal fusion surgery for that process is not very successful and is a really big surgery. Um, so the current regenerative treatment includes taking your bone marrow and carefully injecting it under x-ray guidance into the disc in an effort to control the pain and inflammation and reduce the further degeneration of that disc. Okay. And besides the knee OA study that you mentioned, Dr. Malenga, are any additional studies open to patients over 65? Uh, the partial rotator cuff tear study is? Um, yeah, definitely. Okay. And let's see, we have a couple open questions. And do these studies continue through the COVID-19 crisis? Yes, with all the COVID um, precautions. Okay. And what are the other latest treatment options for moderate knee osteoarthritis besides PRP, visco supplementation, bone marrow, glucosamine, chondroitin? Uh, so you pretty much have a pretty good list there. Um, <laughs> the only one that, uh, may be added is the use of adipose, uh, cell tissues. Um, and we've had great success with that using this microfragmented adipose tissue. Um, that GID study is another method. Um, and those are the me main methods. There's a little bit of a somewhat alternative treatment that actually has pretty good research, 
Uh, one is called prolotherapy or dextrose, actually sugar water. It requires an injection, uh, four to six injections spaced at one to two weeks apart. Uh, my partner does a variation of that, Dr. Bowen, something called prolozone. So you can use ozone gas instead of dextrose, although ozone gas hasn't had that same research as dextrose prolotherapy for knee osteoarthritis. There are research studies that show that actually pre and post arthroscopic evaluation of the joint, after those injections of dextrose, there was improvement in the amount of cartilage in the knee joint. Okay, and if people are interested in signing up for these studies, like the knee osteoarthritis study, how would you recommend that they do so? So either through our website um, or through our main number, um, and then we have different folks assigned to the different studies. Um, so our main number, tell them you're interested in the study and you'll be routed to the right person. Okay, and how can you tell whether low back issues are due to ligaments or disc-related issues? And what is the best therapy for damaged low back ligaments and or disc herniations? Really good question. And most doctors actually don't pursue that very much. And I would tell you uh, probably because it can be really difficult uh, to determine um, whether it's the disc or the ligaments or something else. I would say most doctors actually don't consider the ligaments at all. And here's another area where most doctors don't consider. There are small muscles of the lower back called the multifidi. And if you look under MRI, those multifidi muscle can shrivel up. Those multifidi muscles are very important for supporting your spine. So there's a little work that's been done on injecting a PRP into the multifidi muscle. Um, there are a group of uh, physicians, mostly osteopathic, uh, but again, people that do prolotherapy, uh, which is again, injection of dextrose into multiple areas of the spine. Um, and you can also use PRP if that doesn't do it along multiple areas of the spine. Um, proving it's the ligaments versus the disc sometimes involves doing differential blocks. So you have your doctor inject with Novocaine, let's say into the ligaments because that's easier and safer than into the disc. And if you get that done and you say, wow, uh, it's remarkable how well my back feels. Even if that's only a short period of time, it tells you that those are the areas that are driving your pain. Okay, and what are the available conservative treatment options for a rotator cuff tear? Uh, again, another excellent question. So there is a massive myth that if you have a rotator cuff tear, you need surgery. Recent reviews in orthopedic literature has shown that whether you get surgery or not, meaning whether you have surgery or really good physical therapy, your outcomes 10 years later are the same. Um, but your average orthopedic surgeon is not likely going to tell you that. So, um, so one of the things that occurs is that people get sent to physical therapy and their physical therapists are not very thoughtful in the approach. And they give you stimulation, they give you heat, they throw some rubber bands and they have you do these rubber band exercises. Uh, but that doesn't look at all the different interconnected things that can affect your shoulder. That includes your thoracic, your middle of your back. So many of us, as we get older, we get a little bit forward and curved in the back. When you get a little bit forward and curved, your shoulder blades tend to move out. When your shoulder blades move out, at the end of your shoulder blade is the end of, is the socket that forms the ball in the socket. So if that's not in a good position, the ball's not going to be in a good position. You're going to move and you're going to cause what's called impingement. Um, and you're going to have pain. So there are multiple things that would good physical therapy can address it. Uh, there are things now with these various biologic agents that can affect it. Um, certainly, if you can't move your arm, if you've lost the ability to generate force, then um, that may be a time to have that tendon repaired. But I would again tell you that even full thickness rotator cuff tears can be successfully managed according to the scientific orthopedic literature without surgery. Okay. 
And the next question is, how do you determine if the knee suffers from a biomechanical issue? Yeah, really good question, because I kind of just throw that out there. And so biomechanical issues. So I saw a patient uh, in my office and uh, she was interested. She was going to have knee replacement, but she said, well, let me check this out. And, you know, it becomes really important uh, to look at the whole patient. So sitting there, she looked fine. Her knee motion was actually pretty darn good. But when I had her stand, her knee bent in at a big angle like this. And when she walked, it was even more angulated. And what I explained to her and what I explained to people when I teach this is that these treatments can't do that, right? Orthopedic surgery is built to correct these biomechanical things like angle problems, like bones slipping in and out of place, right? That is perfect, like a fracture that's not in the right spot. Those are, are perfect for orthopedic surgical conditions. If your problem is pain, swelling, um, inflammation, orthopedic surgery is not meant for those kinds of problems. The biologics are actually um, are evolvingly showing to be the thing that can be really helpful. You don't necessarily need these things, but you do need to then think about what is the driver of that pain and inflammation and what can I do to induce a natural healing of that tissue? So diet, exercise, um, strengthening, acupuncture treatment, natural supplements, curcumin, um, ginger, um, omega-3s, all can have this effect that can control pain and inflammation. None of those things will address if you have things that are moving or out of place. Okay, the next one here is, do you still consider interarticular steroid injections in the knee, for knee OA since there are studies suggesting that steroids can speed up cartilage degeneration? Yeah, so your knowledge base on that is probably better than your average doctor, right? And so we refuse to provide treatments that are harmful to patients. So if you come to me and you say, my knee is big and swollen, I can't move it. I'm going to Italy next week. Um, is there something you can do? I will take that fluid off your knee. I will give you one shot of cortisone to get you through. Um, but that's it. So giving cortisone over and over again is like napalm to joints and to tendons. It wipes everything out. So people feel good, but they generally will feel good for about four to six weeks and then things come back in eight to 12 weeks, and then they either need another cortisone shot or things fall apart, and then they need surgery. So I use the analogy of, it's like feeding your kids sugar cereal when they're hungry, right? So if you're in an airport and they're really hungry and all you have is Captain Crunch, you will say, okay, let me give my child this Captain Crunch because that'll help them for that period. But if you keep giving them, you know you're not, it's not a healthy thing to do, and you know they're going to crash and burn if you keep giving them that sugary cereal. So at some point, you have to give them something that's more nutritious and more supportive of their health. And it's the same thing with giving people cortisone shots over and over again. It's not what you're supposed to do. It's not what the guys who discovered cortisone back in uh, the 1940s or early 50s uh, from Mayo Clinic wanted people to do. Okay. All right. So the next question kind of prompts me to just make a little reminder here that the studies that Dr. Malanga did mention, these are not the only conditions that we treat. In fact, if you do not qualify for one of these studies, we still do treatments every day. These are just a few studies that we have that could be options for people. Um, so that just being said, um, there are four conditions uh, meniscus tear, rotator cuff, disc herniation, and knee OA. Are those the only conditions that can be treated with orthobiologics for now? So that was one of those questions. Sure. I mean, uh, the answer to that is absolutely not. Um, so we treat all sorts of tendon problems, tennis elbow, Achilles tendon problems, patella tendon problems. We treat all sorts of different joint problems. Arthritis of the thumb joint, very, very common. Um, so arthritis of the shoulder joint, arthritis of the hip, uh, the ankle. Uh, so 
I would say virtually any orthopedic standard orthopedic condition short of a trauma, short of a fracture, um, we pretty much um, can take care of, I think. Okay, next person asked, uh, may I know the definition of osteopathy? I couldn't hear it clearly. So osteopathy is an old term for osteoarthritis, which is a breakdown of the shiny things, the part that line the joints, the chondral cartilage. Um, so apathy is a pathology of that. Osteo or, or arthro is a joint problem. So um, anything that has an itis is generally felt to be an inflammatory process. There was a time when osteoarthritis was not felt to be inflammatory compared to rheumatoid arthritis because most people with osteoarthritis don't have giant swollen joints that are hot and warm, um, whereas rheumatoid arthritis will tend to have that kind of a joint. But we now know that there are mediators of osteoarthritis that are also quote unquote inflammation or inflammatory. Uh, and those same mediators cause pain uh, and they cause further breakdown of the joint. Okay, and what are the available conservative treatment options for someone with a degenerative meniscus tear? Well, there's plenty, including just work on exercise and building it up. I mean, most degenerative meniscal tears do not need an operation and you shouldn't operate on those. And a really good orthopedic surgeon will tell you, I'm not gonna operate on that. Because if you start taking that tissue out you destabilize the joint and within several months to a year, they're going to tell you, you need a knee replacement. And, you know, knee replacement surgeries are another uh, fastly increasing. There are about 700,000 of those on an annual basis. And the fastest group that's increasing the need for knee replacement is between the ages of 40 and 60. We weren't meant to be putting artificial joints in 40 or 50 year olds, right? because those joints at their best will last 20 years. Um, that's if you're older. They last less longer if you're younger. The complications are there. The outcomes are really not so good for knee replacement surgery as well. So if you have a degenerative meniscal tear, I would say rule number one, try to keep whatever you have in there. Try to support it with all the different nutritional things, exercise things, keep it strong if you need to use some level of bracing. Um, and then try to control some of the pain aspects of it, either through PRP or through this microfragmented adipose tissue. Okay, next person asked, I am 72 years old. Can I participate in the knee meniscus tear study? You, no, you can't. Um, but at 72, your meniscal tear is not your problem. You, you have arthritis. So at 72, meniscal tear would be like a plastic surgeon looking at your face and noting all the um, wrinkles and saying, oh, you also have crow's feet. Um, I mean, you know, uh, it's, it's the other bigger things that need to be addressed. So meniscal tears will often go along with a joint that has tissue breakdown. And depending on the severity, uh, simple things like exercise and nutrition, uh, then platelet-rich plasma has lots of evidence for mild to moderate arthritis. And then if it's more severe, then bone marrow or adipose tissue has reasonably good evidence of working. Okay, what are the conditions that can be potentially treated with prolotherapy? So prolotherapy uh, can treat a variety of ligamentous tendon issues where uh, there's a small element of motion that's causing pain. So it's where, so if you have areas where the ligaments of the tendons are attaching um, and that's irritated, then prolotherapy can be very helpful. So the literature on prolotherapy was very, very weak up until about 10 years ago and now has gotten a lot better. So prolotherapy can treat things like a tennis elbow. It can treat things like a jumper's knee, like patella tendonitis. It can even treat, there's even a study on uh, young people that have Ajgut Schlatter's, which is an irritation where the the kneecap tendon inserts onto the bone. Uh, it's really, really helpful for patients that have back pain that someone was asking about with the ligament attachment and muscle attachment pain. Um, 
those those are the main things. Um, so it, it has a fair amount of application. The doubt, and it's relatively simple. Um, it's relatively inexpensive. Um, if there's a negative to it, is that for most people, you're going to need anywhere from three to four to up to six injections spaced over time. It is just another method of trying to induce a healing response. Um, it's called prolotherapy because it's a proliferative, it's felt to allow for proliferation of ligament and, and tendons to fill in and heal an area. Okay, and is there an estimated time frame for this study from start to finish? Regarding the osteoarthritis study, how many visits are needed and how long are the study visits? Uh, the study visits are pretty brief, probably less than a half hour, probably 15 minutes. Um, it's a one-year study. Uh, I believe there would be four uh, visits. Um, the nice thing about almost all of these studies is that everything is paid for. Um, they pay many participants to come in and fill out forms. So you actually get paid, let's say $50 to come in for your three month visit. I'm not sure the exact amount, so don't hold me to that. Um, the downside is that you potentially could be in the non-active group, but you could still get a great result. So it doesn't, what do you care? At the end of the study, you've learned something, you've pushed science forward, you've pushed um, something to a new level of understanding, and then you could get the active treatment after that. Okay, and what are the uh, conditions that can be potentially treated with stem cell therapy? I believe we touched on this already, but maybe we can mention yeah. you. Uh, you know, so number one, you have to be very careful with the word stem cell. We like to use cellular treatments. Uh, there, like I said in my talk, stem cells are known to uh, be found in a variety of tissue with the largest numbers uh, in the lower part of your pelvis in the bone marrow um, and in adipose tissue. So that's why those are now the most commonly used methods of obtaining cells that have uh, characteristics of stem cells when you look at them carefully. Uh, so what can stem cells uh, help with, or what can some of these cellular treatments help with? They can help with a variety of orthopedic and other medical conditions where the body isn't able to heal an injured area, mostly degenerative conditions where the body has worn down and is now uh, causing a release of various inflammatory factors and factors that cause pain. Okay, and is the OA study randomized? Yes. Okay, and among PRP, hyaluronic acid injections, bone marrow, uh, which is the best treatment for moderate knee OA? Okay, so there have been head-to-head -head studies that have compared hyaluronic acid, HA, the lubricating shots, to PRP for mild to moderate uh, arthritis. PRP has been found to be virtually in every study superior to those. Hyaluronic acid do have positive signaling effects to cartilage. So unlike cortisone, it is a positive signaler. But most studies would show that it lasts about four to six months. PRP studies have shown a duration of effect of about 12 months uh, superior to the hyaluronic acid. There's not really been a well done head to head study of bone marrow compared to PRP. But in looking at duration of effects, the bone marrow and adipose studies look like they have the same level of efficacy lasting longer than a PRP. Uh, so mild to moderate arthritis, uh, when somebody comes to see me, if they've exhausted all the simple things that we talk about, uh, PRP is the first thing to consider. It's pretty simple. It's not as expensive as the other things. It can last on average 12 months, some people a lot more. Okay, and let me see, which treatment option would we offer to a patient with persistent discogenic back pain? So that's still yet to be determined. There are people who are talking about injecting PRP and charging large amounts of money. When I look at that data, 
I find it rather meager and unpredictable um, with maybe a success rate in the mid 50 percent. Um, I'm not sure that's so great. I guess if you're really desperate um, and somebody's saying offering you a knee fu uh, uh, a lumbar fusion, uh, you might want to give that a try. But you have to be careful every time you stick a needle into the disc because every time you do that, there's a risk of infection and there's actually a risk of causing more damage to the disc. Now, many of the discs already have wear and tear. Maybe that's not a significant risk. Um, there's some very interesting literature using ozone therapy. And it, in Europe, it's widely used for disc problem. And it's very simple to do, very safe. Ozone has natural anti-inflammatory and antibacterial effects as well. In terms of the re regenerative treatments, I think the best literature, which still needs to be revalidated and performed in larger studies, is bone marrow injection into the disc. There's an orthopedic spine surgeon out of Colorado who published the best studies. His name is Petin, P-E-T-T-I-N-E. And he demonstrated really remarkable benefits in the study that he um, has performed out even five years, but not very big, big numbers in that study. And certainly somebody else needs to repeat that. I've tried to engage our local orthopedic surgeons and pain management doctors to co-venture with us to collect our own data looking at bone marrow. And hopefully in the near future, we're able to do that. Okay, last two questions here. Um, would you consider, just a follow-up to that question, would you consider a steroid injection in people with discogenic back pain? No, total waste of time, don't do it. Okay, and would you still recommend glucosamine to a patient with moderate knee osteoarthritis since there are some studies suggesting that it does not help? Yeah, so um, you have to be careful about quote unquote, some studies it does not help, right? And looking at medical literature is really, really difficult. It's like noise all over the place. It's like trying to figure out whether you should wear a mask or not, or trying to figure out whether any of the COVID thing information is, is valid. Um, so it does require drilling down. So the best study that was done on glucosamine chondroitin is called the GATE study. Uh, it compared glucosamine chondroitin to Celebrex. And for actually more severe arthritis, it was found to be equally effective as Celebrex. Um, now, again, here's the issue. What is glucosamine and chondroitin? There was another study that looked at 20 different glucosamine and chondroitin products that are sitting on the shelves or being sold on the internet. Um, and the, the potency or the purity of the glucosamine and chondroitin ranged from 10% to 95%. So obviously you wanna use the one that's 90, 95% pure to really determine whether that's gonna have any effect. On a basic science basis, the precursors toward the, the, uh, the substances that make up cartilage are glucosamine and chondroitin. The GATE study would suggest that a trial of glucosamine and chondroitin for six to eight weeks using a high quality product and then seeing how you respond is probably pretty reasonable, uh, pretty inexpensive, and really without any significant side effect. Uh, if it works, then the downside is you need to stay on it. You're not cured. If it doesn't work, then you tried it and it didn't work. But before trying it and saying it didn't work, take the right quality product, take the right amount of dosing of it and give it, you know, six to eight weeks trial. And are there any contraindications to glu glucosamine and chondroitin? Well, a, a lot of those products are made uh, from uh, ground up, um, uh, cartilage from uh, different animal sources. And so if you have uh, allergies to avian allergies, you might. And then uh, people always worry about if you have um, elevated sugars, would the glucosamine elevate your sugars? That's really not a concern. So you should always check with your family doctor if you have other medical conditions. But for the most part, it's a pretty benign, safe supplement to take. Okay, and what is the age range for the partial rotator cuff tear study? Um, that's from 30 to, I think, almost 80. Okay. 
And so you have to have a very high quality MRI to, um, but that gets paid for if you if you come. Okay, and is PRP more preferred than bone marrow because bone marrow is more in invasive? Yeah, so um, the way I prefer things, I start, this is my, my and maybe this works for people, maybe it doesn't. So number one, I want to use the thing that's going to be the least harmful. Um, I want to use the thing that has perhaps the best um, evidence of it working. I want it because I'm pretty cheap. I want to start with something that's the least expensive and the least invasive. So that's the, you know, if I can get a trifecta of something that's safe and works, not very expensive and not very invasive, then that's what I want. But I would tell you that just because something is cheaper and less invasive, if it doesn't work, why bother, right? So if you say, I have severe arthritis of my knee, um, would I recommend PRP? I would say no. If you come to me and you say, I have a rotator cuff tear, um, would I offer PRP of the rotator cuff? I would say no, because the evidence that it's going to do anything is pretty weak. So I'm not going to offer you something that's maybe inexpensive and least invasive. Um, so, but your question in terms of, you know, opting for the lower invasive procedure, if at all possible, is, is valid. And, that, and that's my philosophy as well. Um, I have to tell you that when we first started doing bone marrow, you know, we were really concerned that this was going to be a really painful procedure for patients and patients, you know, when they think about it. Um, but I have to say our techniques and what we've learned in the medical literature shows that you can do a bone marrow aspiration with very high quality, with really minimal discomfort um, to a patient with minimal risk as well. Okay, great. I can actually attest to that. I donated my bone marrow in the office and uh, <laughs> it wasn't nearly as bad as what I thought it was going to be. Highly tolerable. I actually had it done twice. So We didn't make her do that. that she volunteered for that. <laughs> I mean, I know Rachel is one of our super top-notch medical assistants, but it's not a requirement. To do that, so. <laughs> it is not. It was 100% voluntary. Yeah. All right. And we do not have any further questions here, so we can go ahead and end for the evening. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for attending, for your great questions. Um, if you have other questions, you know, we really want to be responsive to that. Um, I think everyone out there needs to do their homework and feel really comfortable before they opt for any of these procedures because you are paying out of pocket for the most part. Um, but quite frankly, I think that should be the way for all of medicine. Just because an insurance company pays for it, it doesn't mean that that should excuse that you shouldn't be aware of everything. Your doctor shouldn't explain everything and you, you shouldn't, uh, you should uh, have done your research regarding any of the things that you have as a patient. I would urge you to, you know, use the least invasive, think holistically, uh, think of the, the good things that our mothers taught us of eating well, exercising, going outside, getting enough rest, um, using simple things like, good supplements, um, and then these things, the exciting part of the things that we offer is that we use your own body tissue to heal yourself. So we are just portals of helping you to heal yourself. And that's the way God made our bodies, and that's the way nature made us, is that we have tremendous intrinsic uh, capabilities of healing. When that gets stuck, sometimes you need a little help. But what we shouldn't do is go against nature and, in, and get in the way of uh, our natural healing of tissue. I also want to thank Rachel as well for, you know, always um, hosting and, and managing the questions and doing her. We actually have one more little straggler here. One more oh. question, Dr. Okay. Uh, would, would you consider a local anesthetic injection together with a steroid injection for knee OA? No, anesthetics are also toxic to articular cartilage. That combination is like, you know, combining kerosene with the uh, lighter fluid, and, you know, it's not a good thing. Um, and the orthopedic literature, that information comes from orthopedic literature. Okay, no further. So like Nancy Reagan said um, many years ago, just don't do it. 
<laughs> All right, great. Thanks, Thanks Dr. Malanga. Okay, appreciate it. All right. Thank you, everybody. If you have any questions, you can call the office. Uh, we're open Monday through Friday. And, um, or you can send us an email at info at njsportsmedicine.com. Again, my name is Rachel, but anybody that answers the phone can help you out and direct you to the right person.